we do these product, you know, these, the Pressbooks monthly product updates in the last Thursday of every month. They're always open to anyone who's interested to attend. And we're always excited to see a good mix of people who are network managers, people who might be open source users, or people who have general questions about what we're up to and what we're doing. So welcome and thank you for being part of our community. Um, the start of the meeting, we often will talk about new features or things that have been released recently that you might have missed or that you might want to know about. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to note is one of the changes that we made uh, has to do with what's available when you make a PDF export. And this was specifically requested by our friends at the Rebus Press who are working on print PDFs. When we generate print PDFs, we first make an XHTML document. And when we do that, we sometimes transform the link structure so that internal links are internal links, external links are external. And what they wanted to be able to do was to display the full link URL in the print PDF. So if a person was reading a book and there was a hyperlink previously, they could also just print and display what that link was for a print reader because you can't obviously click a link in a print book. And so what we did was in the XHTML for each Pressbooks document, I, you can look and you see this, for example, is a, is a link element. It's the ahref. And we've added a new attribute called data-url. And that data-url will contain the full URL for any particular link. What's nice about this is that even for internal links, so here's an internal link that where the href is hashtag internal, the data URL still contains the full path or the full URL, which means that you can display it, you can target and display this with CSS to make it do what you want it to do in your print PDF. You can see here's an example of a book where they've chosen to say, um, after each anchor element, display the data URL attribute with CSS. And as a result, what you might see would be in the print PDF, it would say, see chapter two. Well, normally in the ebook or the digital PDF, this would be a link. But because this is print, you can't click the link. So instead, the link has been printed out in full for the reader. Uh, another thing that we did was uh, we changed the PDF export format. Um, it's a pretty minor change. But before, if you had included PNG images with transparent backgrounds, the PDF format that we were using produced this really grainy, bad looking images. And so people were like, wait a minute, my image was clear and clean. And why, why did you make it look like it was photocopied on an 80 Xerox machine? And we said, oh, sorry about that. So we changed the PDF export, the type of PDF we use for PDF exports. And now you'll notice they look cleaner and as expected. So if you are having problems with transparent PNGs, those have now been fixed in all PDF exports. You don't have to do anything except make a new export, but we want people to know about those two things. Amy asked a question in the chat, which says, does this have to be turned on for each book, referring to the URLs? So um, no, the data URL will be present. It will automatically be there. You will have to target it and display it with CSS if you want to do that. If you'd like a re CSS reference or some sample code or implementation, um, you can email us at premium support or a perva uh, at rebus has been the one who's been the kind of advanced leader on this she or i could share kind of our approach to doing this and we'll try to write something up in documentation if you want to follow up with us i also wanted to note that we have made this is mainly for open source developers or people who are really into the dev side of things we made some updates and changes to our api so we're exposing additional information about each book's metadata mostly which we're using in our pressbooks directory which we'll show you shortly and we have also added an optional integration with uh, an application man performance management tool called Sentry. So Sentry is a tool that you can use to check for, uh, it will produce a message if you have an error or your software processes crash and fail. So it's a tool for developers to use if they want to debug and understand errors and messages for their self-hosted Pressbooks instances. For the ones that we're hosting, we're doing our own Sentry error log tracking in our staging environment. So we are catching things before they get to production. But if you're self-hosting or an open source Pressbooks user, that is something that you may want to do. And there's some information about it in the release notes. One of the problems that I think a lot of us have had in the OER or the open education space is a problem of discovery. A lot of times there are great open resources that have been created, but we don't always know where they're at because they can tend to be in institutional silos or repositories. And it's not always immediately visible to us what other people are working on or have published. We understand that this is a problem, especially in a very decentralized environment like Pressbooks. And so for the past couple of months, we've been working on um, what we are calling Pressbooks directory. 
which is intended to be a searchable, filterable directory of all of the known public books published across many different Pressbooks networks. And so I'm about to share my screen and I'll just drop a link to you. But this is gonna be the first kind of live demo of a work in progress, which represents what we think of as the first version of Pressbooks directory. If you'd like to see it and experiment and play with it yourself in real time, you can visit this URL, it's staging.pressbooks.directory. And what you'll see here, I'll just give you kind of a tour. Here's a very simple landing page. So it'll tell you at the top how many public books are in this directory right now. There's about 2,600. And we're looking across about 67 Pressbooks networks. We'll be adding to this number over time, but this is the initial thing for the staging. You can find books of interest by searching the full text of all metadata using the search field, applying these filters on the left, or simply browsing the cards below. So for example, I'll show you what a search query would look like. And I'll look for chemistry. So as I type, you'll notice here, I'm now seeing just 29 of the 2,635 total results. And I can scroll down and I can begin to see the book cards for all of the chemistry books. The next thing that I could do is I could say, I only want to see books that have open licenses. So I'm gonna filter by license first. And I'll see, uh, these are the licenses available, they're CCBY. So here's the CC licenses, and of those, there are 20 books. So here are 20 openly licensed chemistry books. <clears throat> and then I could say, I only want to see originals. Or I could also say, only want to see books that are clones. And I could filter by that. I might put a word filter count in. So let's say I only want books that are 5,000 words or more, so a certain size. And I might also want to say, I only want books that have at least five H5P activities. You'll now notice that all of these filters are here in place and can be removed individually. And you'll see that I'm now seeing a total of five books across all these networks that meet these criteria. You can see right here that many of these happen to be OpenStax books. So here's one that's hosted at the Penn State Pressbooks Network. This is the OpenStax chemistry book. And if I wanted to see this book, I could simply click on the title and go visit this book live in, in real life and see, okay, it has a CCBY license. And I've, this has now helped me discover a potentially interesting book on the topic of chemistry that I could clone, revise, remix. Again, you can combine these queries. You can uh, do lots of different things with them. I'm going to clear all of them out. I could just clear them here with this button or just start removing them. And just taking you kind of as a tour through this, I'll clear out the search result as well. You can see that we have filters available for license. And it will show you the number of books that uh, are in the database with that particular license applied. So you can sort by license. You also can see that there are subject filters and there are a lot of different subjects available. So this filter can be a bit overwhelming, but it's descriptive. <laughs> I'm scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and I could show less and turn those off. I can also filter then um, on things like whether it's based on, let me clear my results, sorry whether it's uh, an original book, which means that we, we did not see that this was cloned from another press book book, or whether it was based on another book, which means this book was cloned from another book in press books. Uh, the word count filter is pretty helpful to help you see like a base minimum, 5,000 words. So it filters out, you know, I'm now I'm down to just under 1,500 books that meet to that criteria. The H5P activity filters are pretty nice one. Some of you are thinking about interactive courseware or maybe thinking about books that you might want for grading purposes. So let's put a minimum of books that have 50 H5P activities. And you'll now see that I'm down to about 88 books. You'll also look at the book card itself and you'll see a bunch of metadata being displayed here. One of the things that you're seeing at a glance is the language, the license, and if I hover over the H5P icon, it will tell me precisely how many activities are in that book. And soon our plan is to link this so that when you click on the H5P logo, you'll visit the actual H5P listing for that book and can see what 66 activities exist for a given book. So that's coming soon. It hasn't been built yet, but it will be happening soon. Um, you can also then filter by what network you're looking at. So for example, we have people on the call from lots of different networks. And let's say I want to look specifically at the books that have been produced by Milne Library. Here we go, Milne Publishing. So here are the 49 public books that SUNY's made available. And I can filter just by books on this particular network. 
and that's a helpful filter if you want to get a sense for what's public on a given network or on several given networks. So I could apply this to four different, five different networks at, at once. And now I'm only seeing those books from those given networks. And then I could come down and clear it. You also see that there's a language filter, which will show you the, the uh, language that a book is written in according to its metadata. Not all books have languages specified, but those that do, you can filter by subject terms. So, for example, I could see here are the three German language books, and uh, at least one of them is pro someone in this in this uh, meeting is responsible for. So, thank you, Thomas, for contributing to German OER. And then you can also uh, scroll down below. Finally, underneath language and publisher, you'll also see the publisher listed. So, if this was published by a given press, you could filter by the press. So. Many press, many books have specified a publisher. So, for example, I might look at the Rebus community and the Rebus Foundation, and here are the 13 books that this publisher has provided. Whether or not they're all on the same network, you can see that some of these have been cloned elsewhere. And finally, at the bottom, you can look at storage size. Storage size will just tell you how how big this book is on a network. Sometimes it's helpful if you want to know about a cloning operation before time. So those are, the, those are the kinds of features that are available now from the filter. Um, you can see that um, this is fully interactive. The number of results will be increasing over time. The number of books and networks will be increasing as we add more books to the network. Um, there's a couple other visual indicators. Right now, we have put a light red background for books which are all rights reserved. That's meant to indicate that this book, while it's public and available, it cannot be cloned. We may choose a different color that's less um, red as sometimes sends the different signals to people. But for now, that's what that shows. And the other visual indicator that we added uh, that people have asked about, we have a little, I, I'm not finding a good example in the live demo. I should have been better prepared. But there's a little um, red bar along the left-hand side. And that will be present and indicated if the book is public, but not in the network's directory. So that's something we'll be filtering and allowing you to filter for. Because not all public books are in a network's directory, and you may want to filter on only books in a directory, which indicates that they've been vetted, or vice versa. So that's a little bit of the demo for the directory. Um, I'm going to pause here, uh, and I'm going to start answering questions. The first question comes from the chat. Um, JR asked, oh, so the first question was about the pink versus white tiles. So Allison, the answer is, right now, pink means all rights reserved. Whereas uh, if you look at the CC books, none of those have pink backgrounds because they all have CC licenses which permit cloning and remixing. Um, and here's an example of a book with that red border, which means this is a public book, but it is not currently in the network catalog, which also might indicate, hey, maybe this book isn't finished, so we need to test and we'll take a closer look at this one. The next question was, after clicking on the H5P listing, the intention would be to display all H5P book, including unfinished activities, potentially, yeah, JR. So what we would be displaying would be, so for example, let's find a book that has H5P activities, and I'll just show you manually what this would do. Okay, so business writing for everyone. If I visit this book and append the, the URL OER listing at the end, this, oops, not OER, it's H, not OER listing. I'm giving my acronyms. It's H5P listing, thank you. So here, there is a URL for every book, which will show you a list of all H5P activities in the book. And this is where we get that number from, the, through the 32. So what would happen would be, if I hover over this, you can see this book has 32 H5P activities. Clicking on that link would take me directly to this URL where I would see any published H5P activities for a book. Allison asked how often the directory will be refreshed. So what happens for us right now is that the, we have what we call a book fetcher, and that's running on, uh, we, ha we have it running pretty much continuously. So we will set the interval at which it's refreshed, but we expect it to be refreshed uh, pretty frequently, like multiple times an hour. Um, and instantly, any metadata changes will be ingested. If a book is made private, it will be removed from the directory. If a book is deleted or has its URL changed, it will be removed from the directory. And then we'll just re-index we'll, at a regular interval so that you can expect this directory to be up to date within, certainly within each hour. A purpose made a suggestion about the um, filtering on, excuse me, filtering on subject. Definitely, right now we don't have, the subject terms are just all flat right now and it would be good to introduce some more 
uh, taxonomy structure. Right now, this is our first demo, but that's a very good idea and one that we would like to consider so that you can kind of drill down into taxonomy like you would for a good faceted search in a library catalog. John asked, can the list of directory be exported, say, to a CSV file? Right now, no, that's not a feature we built. But in the, in the future, what we would like to build would be some user uh, settings so that you could create an account on the directory. You could save a list of your favorite books, and then you could do things with those lists, including potentially export to a CSV, for example. That's not something we've built yet, but it's something that we anticipate doing down the road. Clint asks, can network hosts control what books in their collection appear in the federated search? For now, the answer to that is the, the way that network hosts control what appears is by controlling the public or unpublic status of books. We do think that people want to have more granular control over that. So our plan will be for the default view to show only books in the catalog and then the probably let the user choose to remove that filter if they wanted to see books outside of the catalog. So in that regard, we're going to try to respect what people have chosen to put in their catalog as the initial view, but we're aware that many networks, the, the conflict here is that many networks like BC Campus or like eCampus Ontario have tons of public books, but they don't use the built-in Pressbooks catalog. They have built their own catalogs for display. And so there's not a good way to build a one size fits all display choice for that. And we're going to need to kind of experiment and work around with things. Hopefully some of the visual indicators will help users. We're planning also to give some more details about all of this stuff. We're going to write a descriptive page and provide some more information about how to use the directory and what the various visual indicators mean. But that's coming next. I just make a steel cue here. Just wanted to say generally what we have here is a first uh, very powerful first cut. We're really excited about it. We do think there's a, a fair bit of consultation we're going to want to do as we refine this, both for UX and, and and these kinds of questions of granularity, et cetera. So we are planning to solicit a bit more feedback into this than, than for instance, just this meeting, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Lauren asked, will there be a filter for books that have hypothesis enabled? Uh, the answer to the short answer to that right now, Lauren, is no. We don't have a good way of recording that in our database or putting it into our metadata. So unfortunately, no, it'll just have to be you go to a book and decide whether hypothesis has been enabled. The tricky part about this as well is that even if a book doesn't turn on hypothesis natively, uh, all public all of the public web is still annotatable with hypothesis with users using browser extensions and things like that. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation. I don't anticipate we'll add hypothesis filtering to the book directory, unfortunately. Um, Jim noted that there are books in, that are not in his public directory that don't have the red line. It's probably because I have a display error that we'll need to fix. This is, uh, we got the things ready just in time for the demo, Jim, but there are some bugs to work out and that sounds like one of them. Um, is the display order completely random? I don't know the answer. Ricardo, can you help me understand what display order is right now? Is it alphabetical? We don't have a, a specific rule to display by default the, the books without any filters. So we need to apply a rule or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So random, answer, right now it's randomly, yeah. So the answer right now is yes, it is random and we will have a display order soon. Yeah, so Lauren suggested a nice feedback here. Instead of having to scroll, 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 allowing people to filter and search within a faceted search would be really nice. So. Suppose I was in subject and sort of typing some letters, it would then present to me the list of available facets. That's a great idea and we'll take that under advisement and see whether that's something we can build. Okay, so the question was about displaying other metadata that's not being captured. For example, if a, web, if a book has a Rebus community project page, linking to that from the directory from the book itself, it'd be a great idea. So here I'm in Pressbooks and right now, uh, you visit an individual book, like say I visit Blueprint for Success in College and Career. Mm -hmm. This is the, the home page is going to display all of the metadata for the book. And mm -hmm. you can see some of it displayed here and displayed here. The source of that metadata is book info. And so everything in our directory, more or less, has to be entered manually by the book creator at the book info stage. And then we just right. faithfully re re reproduce it. What we could do, which we have not done, 
would be to add a book info field which says Rebus community homepage or Rebus mm -hmm. or something like that. And then if we added that to the book info field and users entered it, then we absolutely right. could use and display it in the directory. So that's a feature that we would need to consider with Rebus, but, but I mm -hmm. think that's a great idea, especially since um, we get along so well with Rebus, I would have no problem. With that. <laughs> that's what I've heard. <laughs> and Aperva is chiming in. Aperva probably has even better project uh, ideas than I do since she knows the, okay. So I will, Lauren, it sounds like something that's something for me, for me to work on as, the, as a feature request idea for book mm -hmm. metadata. And I will talk to, I'm happy to talk with you outside this meeting and then also to talk with people at Rebus to see the best way to represent that in our book info. Great. Thanks so much, Steele. And Aperva. Okay, so that's a demonstration of the features for the directory. Uh, if you'd like to look at the staging directory, you're welcome to do so. The URL is staging.pressbooks directory. Please note that it's a staging directory. It's subject to change. It may not be perfect all the time. We will let people know when a public V1 version of the public directory will be available, and we'll share that URL when we have better news to share. We hope it will be soon. You can see some of the progress that we've made so far. The second thing that I wanted to demonstrate and share was a little bit of an update about the other big feature that we've been working on that many of you are interested in. And it's the transformation of Pressbooks from simply a uh, interactive book publishing tool to something that can be used inside the learning management system as courseware. So the big thing that we wanted to share and announce is there is a global standards body for higher education called IMS Global. And the standard that they maintain for third-party tool integrations with LMSs and grade passback is called LTI 1.3. We're really pleased to announce that this month we achieved IMS Global certification for the LTI 1.3 and Advantage specification. Specifically, our tool is certified as an LTI 1.3 tool, and we have specific certification for the LTI assignment and grade services uh, Advantage kind of piece. And these are the two pieces that are most important for, for doing uh, third-party tools with graded components in the learning management system. So the certification was achieved earlier in June, and now I want to show you what this would actually look like if you were to be using this as a Pressbooks user. So this is an additional add-on for the Pressbooks product. Any Pressbooks network can purchase this uh, for an additional add-on price and use it uh, on a per user basis. The institution would pay for it rather than the student or the learner. Um, and it's available. You can talk to our sales team and talk about whether you'd like to try this out on a small scale or a large scale at your school. Um, Sarah on the chat is the person who knows most about that. But I want to show you the actual product user interface. Here is a Pressbooks book. And this is uh, an example of a language learning activity. And you can see that there's a, a bunch of text here. And then you see there's an H5P activity that's been embedded there, two more that have been embedded here, and two more at the bottom. Down below the chapter, you'll see a box that lets you do the LMS grade reporting. So as the instructor, I can configure this chapter to be a graded activity. And what I'm able to do is put the H5P ID, the actual number, for any of the graded activities that I want to include in my aggregate grade. In particular, this chapter has been configured to use five different activities, each of which have different point values. Those are the five activities in this book. I can set a beginning date and an ending date for what I want to include in the grade scheme. And I can also choose a grade scheme. I can choose, I want to use the average of all student attempts. I want the best of all student attempts. I want the first attempt a student makes or the last attempt a student makes. Once that's configured, I have a launch URL that I can bring into my learning management system. And so here's an example of a, a, a Canvas course where these activities have already been configured. So let's say I'm a student. In this course, I'm logged in as a student. And this course has three particular assignments. In the LMS, you can configure the grades, the point value to be whatever point value you want it to be. And Pressbooks will always send back a scaled percentage value on the overall score, which will then be converted to the point scheme that you want to have. So for example, let's pick this language activity here. We'll remember that the language activity was configured to send my last attempt. So I'm a learner. I've already done this attempt once. And the first time I did it, I scored an 8.59 out of 25. So I have a 34%. Let's try this assignment again. 
and we should see my score be updated with the newest score. So here I'm a student, and what I've just loaded is the live version of this activity in my LMS. And I'm reading through, it's a conjugation activity, and let's practice. Uh, I'm gonna turn the sound off. I'm not doing so great, but I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> and I work through this activity, I'm getting real-time feedback, and I realize I need to study my star and a star verbs. And I've scored, I think, two or three out of six here on this first one. Two out of six. I could retry it. I could show my solution. But I'm going to move on, and I'm going to do the definite articles. And I'm going to fill in the blanks. I'm going to say, just try to do my best. I keep putting zero instead of O. Oh, that's a mistake. And I'll check my answers. I got seven out of nine. Well, and it's going to ask me, which is the highest tree? I'll click this. That's the highest tree. I got that one right. And then I'm going to do some verb conjugation. So, uh, and let's see how I did. I got zero out of 13. I really did poorly. Okay. And then I'm going to answer some questions about berries. It was Morango. Ah, Amora. And so I have a new attempt here. And so now that I've finished this activity, the student can go back and look at grades and they'll see the latest attempt. My grade has now been updated and I scored a little bit higher this time. I now have an 8.59. My grade was updated to a 34.38%. And I can, can, can keep repeating this activity as a student as many times as I want until the grade has been satisfied. And that's a little bit about how the Pressbooks uh, LTI integration with grade passback works now. I showed you a little bit about how it's configured by an instructor on the back end and then how it would look for a student who'd be participating in the activity. If I were to come back to the assignments, I could also then jump into a different activity and you'd see, I see this activity when I'm done, I could click next and it would just take me in the course to whatever happened to come next, whether it was another Pressbooks activity or quiz or any other element or attribute in the course. So um, that's where we're at with the LTI 1.3 grade uh, passback feature. That is something that we are uh, preparing for public release right now. And if you have questions about its availability or how you can use it at your school, I'm happy to take those in the chat or uh, I can pause the recording and take them in real time too. All right, so the question was how do I incorporate a, how do I currently add an assignment or a graded activity in Pressbooks for an LTI tool? The first thing that need to happen would be you'd have to have a global integration done by your LMS administrator, just like any other uh, right. uh, uh, LTI tool. So once that happens, I'm in a course, I'm ready to create an assignment. So I would click the new button and I'm going to click external tool and I'll click more options here. So it's going to be an external tool. I'll call, I'll call this fake chapter and I'll say it's worth 100 points and external tool, and I click find, and it says, oh, which one do I want to use? Uh, I would pick the Pressbooks LTI tool. I went in the wrong course, so I'm not seeing it, but I'd click the Pressbooks LTI tool, and then I would paste the, the, the link from this here. And once you do that, then the tool is configured, and it would load and work. So that's the process right now, Jim, uh, for Canvas. For other LMSs, it looks a bit different, and we'll have that documented and available for people who want to see it. We can also schedule like individual demos. Sarah and Hugh have been doing those for people and get in more detail with that. Perfect. But um, we're, we're hoping that the LMSs will improve the uh, common cartridge and LTI 1.3 integration. It kind of varies by LMS right now, unfortunately. Uh, Moodle, it works fairly well, except that you have to save your settings post import before it recognizes the configuration. Uh, Blackboard, it works. I think as intended, Desire to Learn or Brightspace has the same problem as Canvas, but you can do them manually on a one by one basis. And Sakai, we're still troubleshooting with Sakai. So those are the five big LMSs that we've been testing with. All right, thanks, thanks. All right, so the, the, I only left a couple of minutes and I apologize for that, but the mo another very important part of these meetings is the community roundtable. And what this is, is it's an opportunity for any of you to share projects that you're working on, things that you have been doing that you think would be of general interest to others in the community, whether it's open source development 
or open textbook projects, or just general projects or questions you have. So I'm going to mute myself, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to start listening. So anybody who'd like to share, please feel free. Um, I can share that at the U of A, we've uh, launched Pressbooks and done a professional learning community around introductory Pressbooks in June, and then we'll do a more advanced learning community in July. But we had 40 people sign up, and about 80% of them were unknown to me. I had no idea these folks were interested in OER and open pedagogy. And there's just so much excitement and they've all started creating new projects. So it's been really great. And Lovely. I'll add, I also, I really appreciate the responsiveness of the Pressbooks premium support. Our participants have had a lot of questions about H5P and settings and, and so being able to um, get help from the premium support has been fabulous. Okay, Hugh wanted me to mention one thing that we're planning. We were just about to announce it, but we're, we know that people want more training and support for end users. So we're planning a new uh, system, just like we do this call kind of for network managers and open source people. We're going to schedule uh, monthly training sessions that will be open to any end users on EDU networks. So we'll do a, like every month we'll do a, in, like a Pressbooks 101 training that you can send new faculty users to. And then the next month we'll do like an advanced Pressbooks training. And then the next month we'll do intro to Pressbooks. And then, a, so we'll start offering those and we'll share information with all of our hosted networks soon. We're planning to do something similar for network managers. It'd be like an ask me anything or a training refresher session once a month. And more information should be coming from us in the next week about that. Hopefully that feels exciting to those of you that have the EDU networks. If you're willing, Lauren, I know you did something for the Open Textbook Network. Uh, do you have anything to share about that? Or could you tell people more about what you did and if there's any resources available from that? Um, yeah, it looks like the um, recordings are up on YouTube now. Um, so I, I did a two-part session for the Open Textbook Network Summit um, this week on how I've been teaching Pressbooks to faculty through um, Zoom workshops. Um, I've been doing a, an hour and a half introduction to Pressbooks and then a separate advanced Pressbooks workshop. Um, so in part one of the OTN session, I did kind of a demo of how I teach the workshop and how, how we've sort of built our network and um, developed these workshops. And then in part two, it was sort of programmatic implications and questions that teaching these workshops and sort of spreading the word of Pressbooks um, has meant for our OER program here. So um, yeah, let me see. I was just looking at the YouTube link, but I'll look for that and I can share it in the chat. Yeah, and hopefully it's useful for others. Um, we've seen growing interest in Pressbooks uh, since COVID and um, have been pleased to have a lot of um, student created uh, works uh, published on our network here and a lot of growing interest in that as well. So hopefully more more good things to come. So yeah. Oh, and thank you so much, Elaine. It was great to uh, be with you and Ariana on the panel this morning. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over time. I'm more than happy for anyone else to stay and share good news or things that they've been working on. Okay, um, the only final thing that I wanted to mention is that there are the open education uh, annual awards. There's some nominations that are open through the end of the month. There's a lot of great categories for individuals, for organizations, for people. I think many of you are worthy and deserving of some of those awards or know people or love people that are also in that situation. <coughs> so I would consider folks taking a look at that and um, putting together a nomination. It could be a self-nomination or a nomination of someone else in the community that you admire that you think is worthy of recognition. Oh, Anita, you're so fast on the drop. So the OE, the Open Education Consortium, Anita's dropped a link in the chat there, um, and I'll put it into the meeting agenda notes as well. Thanks everybody for your time and attention. I really appreciate being part of a supportive global community of open education advocates. Thanks for taking time to join us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next month or talking before then if, if uh, circumstances allow. See you soon.